Hey folks, welcome to the Master Gardener Show. I'm Jim Hunter, your host, and we've got a great show today on trees, the five most wind resistant trees that we have in our landscape. We also have a special guest, Alicia, commonly called Tree Girl, who is a tree expert and tree climber and a cutter. And uh, so that's all coming up next. standing by a nice little specimen of a live oak tree and arguably maybe our, our best specimen tree, our best shade tree. Uh, of course living uh, way over a thousand years. Uh, we have some nice big ones. They're slow growers. They're uh, among the tops of the most wind resistant trees that we have in the state of Florida. They're an evergreen tree. They keep their leaves year round but uh, Evergreen trees, when that happens, they drop their leaves, of course, year round too. So they'll drop a few leaves every day. And you may notice on, uh, on some of the trees here that the, where the growth is uh, older, it's kind of an, uh, a darker green, a different kind of a, almost, a, uh, a, almost an army green color, a little grayish and the color of the, of the uh, leaves as they get more, as they're older. The leaf shape can actually change a little bit from a young tree to a mature live oak tree uh, and of course you know live oak trees can get a hundred feet tall so it needs a lot of space it's just going to be a slow grower for you an easy tree to grow being native uh, just normal tree fertilizer normal water likes well-drained soil uh, does not do well in, in uh, wet areas but uh, most of Florida it does fantastic. This is probably one of the older live oak trees that we have on the property. We don't have any really super, uh, this one's probably about 75 years old. You know, they are slow growers. So actually some of those really big monsters that take up the whole front yard that you see around the neighborhoods are probably well over 100 years old. Uh, these are, the, the, old, the old days before air conditioning, uh, live oak trees were tremendously uh, an asset to keep your house cool. So property that had live oak trees were uh, uh, a lot more valuable than, of course, uh, houses that were in full sun, baking in Florida sun all day long. So it's a great shade tree. It really cools down the whole perimeter of your house when you have these as mature trees. So we'd be lucky to have these and they probably are, are still a a very much of a tree asset to your your property. Uh, live oak trees, wonderful, wonderful trees. Wow, did you see that that hawk? That's kind of nice. Uh, we get them out here all the time. It seems like, and uh, that's one of the advantages of having trees. Is you're gonna have a habitat for different birds and different species of animals too so it's a great thing for us to have the trees. I'm standing here in the middle of a, a sand live oak very uh, up trees. Uh, they don't get real big maybe about 30 feet. Of course they're very hardy and they're just a dwarf version of the larger live oak tree and you'll usually find these around the coast uh, maybe on that first, after the first trees that you see from the sand dunes, uh, you know, quite a bit of them around Daytona Beach and Brevard County. Uh, the sand live oaks, a good little uh, live oak tree, it just doesn't get as big as the, uh, as the uh, larger live oak tree. And if you want a small tree to stay small, this would be a good choice. Uh, these are probably in the neighborhood of probably around 50 years old, these trees here. So another good wind resistant tree, the sand live oak. You know it's right there on the ocean catching all that strong breeze coming in. But uh, a great tree. Wow, southern magnolias, uh, native to the southeastern United States, uh, grand old tree of the south, uh, evergreen tree. And you can see the big guy here behind me. Uh, they go to about 90 feet. Uh, 
and probably lived, you know, a little over 100 years. Uh, there's some old magnolias around in, in town and around in the south also. Uh, once again, ever, evergreen tree with that beautiful, huge white flower that comes out in April and smells so good, and smells up the whole neighborhood, but uh, got, got to be one of the bi nicest big trees with desirable flowers on it, the southern magnolia. Uh, yeah, everybody should have one of those in their yard and uh, gives you some shade and uh, gives you a nice aroma. Uh, and usually May is when their strong blooming month is. There's another variety called a little gem, which is a, a dwarf uh, magnolia that only goes about 30 feet. It's been very popular these days. The little gem is the only variety of magnolia that will bloom off season. Still blooms in May, but can kick out sporadic flowers in the summer or in the fall of the year, even in the winter time. And of course, the, uh, the Southern Magnolia is also in the top five for wind resistant trees. Can take a lot of wind. It's very deep rooted, very strong tree. Southern Magnolia. Another tree, or actually a palm tree that's in the uh, in the top five is the uh, sable palmetto, or sometimes called cabbage palm, uh, which is our state tree. And uh, it's a good one, very, very wind resistant, of course. And uh, cabbage palm, because if, you, uh, if you're out, out in the boonies and like the Indians, early settlers did, you can eat the heart of the cabbage, uh, which is the bud part of the new growth of the cabbage. Uh, so that's an excellent source if you're out camping and you, and you need some food or something like that, you can do that. Uh, but a great tree. So these are the boots, which is where the frond came out originally and the frond's been cut off. And these boots will eventually fall off and you, you will have a, a smooth trunk on it. Uh, some people like the boots on, some people like it smooth, but uh, I just prefer to let them come off naturally rather than, sometimes if you tear them off you know, prematurely, you can, you, can, you can kind of open up the plant to an infection. And, and these guys can go probably pretty close to 100 feet in height. If you get down to some of the older areas, you'll, you'll see some very large cabbage palms. Uh, wonderful state tree all over the state, from the Everglades to uh, uh, the Georgia line, you're gonna, you're gonna find cabbage palms. That's a good, good choice as a state tree. Well, and the, the last of the wind-resistant trees uh, from the university is the Florida dogwood, Cornus florididia, because uh, it grows far, far south as Florida and pretty far north, probably up into Canada, there's, there's varieties of dogwoods, uh, a lot of different varieties of dogwoods in uh, Asia. And uh, so as you get further north, you get into more pink dogwoods and that kind of thing. The Florida dogwood is a white dogwood, usually blooming in February or March. Uh, just a nice small to mid-sized tree, moderate growing as far as rate of growth, and usually see dogwoods, uh, you know, maybe 30 feet, 35 feet, something like that too. Uh, they're native, uh, the, the Cornus floridae is native to the Appalachian Mountains. So if you go up in there, you'll, you'll see a lot of dogwoods there. And of course, they're native here in in Florida too, going all the way down to central Florida with their range of growth. A uh, great small tree, deciduous, it's gonna drop its leaves, it's gonna bloom with the white flowers, and then, uh, and then after it flowers out, it's gonna relief itself for the, for the rest of the spring and the summer and early fall. Florida dogwood, a great, great tree. Has some little problems with some fungus diseases going around, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a great tree to have. Hey folks, I'm here with Alicia, the famous tree girl, and uh, she's going to tell us about some of her equipment. And well, tell us a little bit about you, Alicia. Well, I've been in the tree industry for around 13 years. I've been a practicing member of the ISA, which is the International Society of Arboriculture. I'm also a two-time tree climbing female champion of Florida. So I'm here today to walk through the property with Jim and take a look at all his beautiful trees and see if I can't lend some assistance. A lot of work here, a lot of work we got around here, especially after the storm. 
Yeah. Yes, a lot of storm cleanup going on around here. Lots of hangers and deadwoods. So we're gonna make sure that we have our safety gear today. We're gonna have our helmets and our safety glasses. Very good. And um, first off, we're gonna make sure we have the right tools. Yeah, sh job. show us your tools. You got a bunch of stuff here. Well, we have a good amount of tools for different reasons. We have our hand saws for nice trimming. It get, leaves a nice, thin cut on any tree limbs that you're going to be cutting or you can even use them on your shrubs. You also have our typical small pruners. Everybody should have a set of these. These can cut up to an inch. So when we're trimming out our small shrubs and trees, we like to have a pair of these on hand. If we need to get into the canopy, maybe there's a piece that we can't reach. We have our long pole snips here. Oh, that's nice. This actually has an additional leg that we can utilize, and this will help us get just those little tiny end pieces off. So we may be utilizing this today as well. If we get into some larger, lower branches, we can utilize our power pruner here, which of course, you'll make sure you wear all your safety gear when you're getting into the big stuff. Uh, we have our bigger chainsaws in case we need to fell something today and buck up some wood. We also have my smaller trim saw here. Um, doesn't matter what brand you use, whether it's Echo, Husky, Steel, they're all pretty much going to work for you as long as you have the right size for the right tree. I've also got down here some smaller loppers. We got some hedgers. Depending on what you want to cut, whether it's some shrubbery, you want to get a nice clean edge to that. You can utilize these to get that pretty azalea into shape for the fall. Uh, we also have some loppers for something over an inch. If you're going to go up in the canopy, or if you're going to be on a ladder, if you're going to be running around underneath a bunch of deadwood, make sure you protect yourself. These are climbing helmets. They're side impact rated as well. Make sure you have a pair of these. If you're going to be bucking up wood, or you're going to be picking up a lot of fallen debris on the ground, and you're going to need to cut it up, make sure you have the right chaps on. I'm actually wearing a pair of climbing pants, so I won't need to wear these today. But you also want to make sure that you utilize some gloves. There's many different brands out there, many different styles. Make sure you have your right gloves on so you don't cut yourself. Like these hand saws are very slick, they will cut you very easily. So you can pick these up, different range of prices, anywhere from five to 20 bucks for the high end stuff. Safety glasses, make sure they're rated. Make sure if a branch comes down, if you're cutting a branch that's pinched, it could come back and hit you in the eyes. I've been close to happening before. We have ones that wear straight over the eyes, or you can pick up the other style that goes over your own reading prescription glasses. So no excuses, guys, wear your eyewear. One thing I'd like to stress to everybody is to make sure that you sterilize between cuts. Make sure you sterilize between trees, especially. If you're dealing with blight, sometimes you have to sterilize between cuts. If you don't have to deal with blight, you can sterilize your equipment between trees. We don't want to spread any kind of fungal diseases, pathogens, insects. Um, just keeping them nice and pretty too will keep you happy through the winter because we want to make sure that they're not going to be rusting out. So I always sterilize, make sure the companies that you hire, if you do hire an arborist, sterilize in between. We don't want to spread any other kinds of diseases. We have the oak wilt going on. We have all kinds of... Is that alcohol that you use to sterilize? Yes, the just mix that I use, I use half alcohol and half water. I've also known people to use um, the wipes, just basic Lysol wipes that you have around the house. Those will work, any of the cleaning wipes. Just make sure you give them a nice little clean over. See how this one's dirty? I haven't cleaned this one yet. So we don't know what's hanging out on this guy. But before every job that I utilize, especially coming to your nursery, Jim, because I don't like to bring any bad stuff to your nursery, I make sure I clean, use clean chains, clean out my saws, have it all ready to go for you. Um, if you do have a professionalist going up your trees, make sure they have a copy of your address in case they get hurt. We can call for an emergency aid to come out and they have your address right there on hand and you want to make sure you call for a high angle rescue team. That'll bring out a ladder truck the first time to get them down safely. Unless they have a secondary climber there, you want to make sure you know what high angle rescue means. I also, on my jobs, always have a first aid kit as well as a trauma kit. If we're dealing with chainsaws, you can, a little nick goes a long way. We want to make sure we can stop that blood. So now that we've talked about all the safety procedures and proper equipment and everything, I'd love to see you guys over here and we can demonstrate some of these strategies on there, pruning. Yeah, <laughs> okay, let's, let's go over and check that out.
wow, Alicia, what what have you got going on there? You're you're all geared up. Oh yeah, in, in the arboriculture industry, if you're going to ascend a tree, you're going to have to proper equipment to do so. I have a tree motion saddle that has a suspension bridge and I've attached a swivel to keep my line from twisting. I have what we call a rope runner. This is a single line climbing style for those of you who've never seen it before. This will help me ascend the tree without having to use spikes, without having to injure the tree at all. And I can actually tie this as a canopy anchor to whatever suitable branch is big enough that I like, or I can also change it up to a basal anchor and run through multiple trees without ever touching the ground. So this is a really good uh, tool that I've used to access a lot of difficult trees and to keep me safe uh, while doing some difficult, dangerous trees. Um, I've got a semi-static line. I've got my hoss and my foot ascender and my chest ascender and this is going to give me a hands-free ability to go up the rope. I can climb it from anywhere I like. This will keep me off vines, keep me off of dangerous critters or whatever's in my way. That's quite an ordeal. I'm going to stand back and let you kind of do your thing and she is the woman. Well, Jim, now that I'm up in the top of the tree, I can see the top of the limbs to see what's really damaged and what just needs to be pruned back. And there's a good amount of vines in here, good amount of deadwood as well. So I'm thinking I'm gonna take a trip out to the end there and fix that stuck back cut because that's not gonna heal properly. Sounds good to me. Now, anytime I go to use a chainsaw, I wanna make sure that I have two points of attachment. So I'm going to use my lanyard here and I'm going to create a secondary attachment point in case something happens and I cut through my main line, I have a backup. Now, body positioning is key in this industry. I'm going to make sure my tail's out of the way. I'm going to make sure all the bystanders are out. Are we clear? I think I'm good, yeah. All right, it's gonna get a little noisy. When you're operating a chainsaw, whether on the ground or in the tree, you wanna make sure you have two hands on the chainsaw at all times. It's a good possibility of kickback. All clear. I should mention before I start cutting, I'm gonna make a three-point cut. I'm gonna cut under, and then I'm gonna make my completed cut over, and then I'm gonna make a final cut. We don't want to cut too far into the branch collar. We don't want to make a flush cut. So when I'm done, you'll see the finished result of a proper cut. extra pieces of dead wood there. Very good, I'll, I'll pick that stuff up. So, that's a proper three-point cut. If you guys zoom in on the cut that I made, you can see that now that it's utilized the branch collar, it'll send a chemical response for that tree to close the wound. Now, I'm gonna run through the tree and do a little dead wooding. Thank you, ma'am. and proper dismount. Whoa, that was graceful. Very nice, <laughs> very, very nice. Okay. We got that cut up really nice and it gives us some good elevation for the uh, trucks going underneath the driveway here. And it, it really, uh, you've, you've got a little more to cut on it, but you get a good start on it. It looks really good, Alicia. Yeah, I like that we were able to get some of the major deadwood out from falling on passerbyers or vehicles. And we were also able to get enough clearance to get your, your nursery trucks in and out here. But we'll revisit it later and get it prettied up. We've got some more to do. Sounds good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is our little white oak tree, the only one we have on the property. You usually find white oak a little bit further north than central Florida, but we have one here, and it needs a little 
little, uh, it's a little fluffy, as Alicia would say, so we, we need to trim it a little bit there. And what do you think we need to cut there? Well, Jim, uh, looking at it, it's, uh, it's not an old growth tree. It's relatively young. So that lets me know that we need to take about a third of the green off just to kind of space out and get a good structure going to this tree so that we can keep it for many years to come. It's got some hurricane damage in it still, little bits of brown that need to come out. It needs to be thinned a little bit, that way we can prevent some major limb breakage during our next hurricane. A lot of this can be done from the ground. A lot of homeowners can do smaller trees like this. I love this Marvin pruner for that. Uh, you can get right up in there. And what I'm looking for while I'm trimming is any attachment point that's weak or damaged or anything that's drooping down. We're also going to look for anything in impeding any of the traffic or any of the lawnmowers around here. We want to make sure that we train this tree to grow to stay for many years to come. So I'm going to go around and I'm going to show um, Jim here how to do some proper pruning with our Marvin Sounds pruner. Sounds good, get, get Marvin there. A lot of people don't like the interior suckers and you can, you can use the Marvin pruner for the higher up to reach ones. I'm just gonna get it right flush to the bark, make my cuts nice and pretty. We got some lower suckers here that can come off as well. So we're just gonna go around the tree and see what can stay and what can't. This is a little low. It's gonna end up getting in the way of our pedestrians. I'm gonna go a little higher. This branch here is going back towards the crown, towards the center of the tree. We don't want that to happen. We want it to be a nice spread out white oak. We wanna have the plumage going away from the center lead. The center lead on the tree is if you were to draw a line from the base all the way up. We want to establish one center lead. We don't want two large limbs going together competing for the top. They'll shade each other out. They'll give each other an improper structure which could later on lead to big cavity tear outs. So Jim, what do you think? You want to help me? Sure, yeah. You walk around. I'll give yeah. you the Marvin pruner and okay. you take off what you feel you need and I'm gonna walk around with my handsaw and see what I can accomplish with that. Okay, that's a little bit too Big for Marvin there, and then let's see if we can go ahead, Marvin there. One of the main things I look for when I'm pruning is leaving a good lateral on every large branch. I don't want to strip out every single interior sucker and leave it barren. That's uh -huh. improper. They call that lion's tailing. And when you lion's tail a tree, you actually leave it's susceptible to more wind damage in the long run. What happens is the end gets so heavy and so full of brush that the hurricane winds will come and push on it like a sail on a sailboat and you'll get an entire limb to fall and fail because you made it. Yeah, we see a lot of that after the storms. So what I do is I try to leave a good choice sucker behind, such as this one right here, that way, in case this limb gets too long and too low, I can reduce it back to this sucker and continue the structure of the limb without having a bigger cut. We want to train these trees while they're young. The smaller the cut, the smaller the wound, the easier it is for the tree to close it over. Now this was an improper. I just cut it off. I have to cut this down another inch to make it flush so that the actual tree can close it over. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that now. So I love these hand saws, they make a nice fine cut. I'm going to go ahead and tailor this sucker above it so that it's not rowing back towards the tree. And as you can see, just a little bit of desuckering we've done has opened up the opened tree up already. Opened up the tree nicely, yeah. So a little more work to be done here and it'll be a finished product in no time. How's it looking, Jim? Uh, it's looking awesome, Alicia. Good job. Well, that's really getting some light in through that tree and taking off a lot of bad suckers. Appreciate it. Well, definitely think the grass is gonna like this extra sunlight that we're giving it. I think it will too around the tree. All right, Jim. I'm gonna take this lower branch down because it's in the way of our trucks and our bobcats. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do our three-point cut. The reason I'm doing the three-point cut is to minimize the possibilities of tearing. 
What we don't want to do is to make one cut and have it tear the bark down the trunk of the tree and create a big wound that the tree won't be able to close properly. So I'm going to start my bottom cut right about six inches out from the branch collar and the branch collar is this little swell right around the trunk of the tree where it establishes a branch. We don't want to cut through that branch collar and create a flush cut. That's going to create too big of a wound. So we're going to go a little bit out and that's going to help heal and round off our wound. So I'm going to start with my undercut about six inches out to prevent it from peeling. And I'm going to make my top cut about half an inch above it. That way the weight of this, if I was to cut it through with one cut, the weight of the end of this limb would cause it to tear. So this, this eliminates that possibility. So once I'm done with my second cut, I'll come and make my final cut nice and pretty. That way it doesn't tear the bark. And you see how this right here started to peel, but because I made my undercut, it stopped. So now I'm going to make my final cut. And now that is perfect cut. It's not too much left so that it's going to have stored energy reserves and sucker back out on you within a year, but it's also cut enough into the collar so the collar will round over and heal it. So that's what we're looking for when we say proper cuts. If you make a proper cut on your tree, the extra layers as the tree grows will actually encompass this and help it survive longer down the road. Well, Jim, I think that's about it for this tree. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed the show. We had a good show on uh, wind resistant trees and Alicia Tree Girl has shown us some really good cutting tips for our, our backyard trees. And if you have any uh, questions, give us a call at the Extension Service. That's 407-665-5550. And let's see if we can get Alicia to come down and... <whistles> Alicia, come on down, Tree Girl. Hey, fantastic job. Thank you very much today. We appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me today, Jim. Thank you, dear. I really appreciate being on your show. It's been a pleasure. Thanks Thank for letting you, me plant your trees. Yeah. Hopefully you guys learned something today. <laughs> call your local arborist. <laughs> Give us a call at the extension. God bless. Uh, happy gardening. <laughs>